Hello everyone, Dr. Alex Vasquez here, and today I have our next video in this series on human microbiome and dysbiosis in clinical disease. Today we are going to talk about the gut microbiome brain mind axis in clinical care. And this image gives you kind of an overview and some foreshadowing of the things that we'll talk about today. What I'm going to focus on today is the introduction and structural concepts. And then I'll get into specific gut brain and gut mind mechanisms. I'm going to call that part one. And then on part two, of course, we'll talk about defensible clinical implications and interventions, things that you can do and feel very confident about. Once you understand the mechanisms, I think you'll feel much more confident. And then once we look at some of the condition-specific uh, protocols and the research and the associations and mechanisms involved, then I think you'll feel even better about this. Also, of course, you know, many of the interventions that we use in the treatment of dysbiosis are very low toxicity. They're very safe. They're widely available. So we don't have to pass a very high threshold in order to implement those treatments. We can use them often empirically, often on day one. Sometimes the treatment is less expensive and some even might argue uh, safer than venipuncture and lab tests. So again, we'll cover these in sequence. Part one, introduction and structural concepts, specific gut brain mechanisms. And then part two, defensible clinical implications and interventions followed, of course, by summary and conclusion. This video is video number 12 in the series. We've talked about mechanisms, pathophysiologic responses, prototypes, concepts, and microbes. And then I covered dysbiosis by location, starting with the mouth, sinorespiratory tract, genitourinary skin, blood and tissue environment, and then a large four-hour presentation on gut dysbiosis. Now we're at number 12 with gut brain to be followed by hopefully a very quick review. All of this information is protected by copyright. Some of it's protected by trademark. Scope of this information is educational information for licensed clinicians. This is not individual health advice. Doses are for adults unless specified otherwise. Disclosure of financial relationships. I have served as a consultant researcher and lecturer for Biotics Research Corporation. Some of the treatments I discuss might be considered unapproved or off-label per FDA definitions. So I encourage prescribing physicians to take the ultimate responsibility for prescribing for their individual patients. Your participation in this presentation and study of the materials should enable you to define some of the terms that we use within this conversation, dysbiosis, eubiosis. We'll look at some new terms and some new microbes today, actually at the start of this presentation. Explain the role of multifocal polydysbiosis in metabolic and inflammatory and therefore obviously allergic and autoimmune diseases. Analyze, interpret laboratory results for significance or lack thereof. Identify actionable alterations in microbial patterns, phenotypes of dysbiosis-induced disease. Demonstrate skill in clinical reasoning. Implement treatment plans consistent with the four main components of evidence-based medicine. I've reviewed those previously. Reject or nullify distractor data. That's something that we had to do a lot of in our medical school exams. So before I start today's presentation, I'm going to kind of tighten up a few loose ends and ensure that we've covered all of the most important bases. When I review the material again in video number 13, I'm going to compile all of the slide presentations together. I'm going to go through all of them. I've updated a few of those presentations since they were recorded. And the reason for that is rather obvious. New information has been published or new ways of explaining things uh, occurred to me after the recording, as sometimes happens. So I encourage you to study all the videos, and then we'll take a quick run through everything, and we'll touch on a few updates. I'll mention a few updates uh, in this section on loose ends. So a long time ago, back in 1975, uh, famous psychologist James Hillman put a notebook together. He called it Loose Ends, so I'm kind of alluding to that book. With regard to the microbiome and dysbiosis, some of the terms that we want to be familiar with, in addition to the ones that I've reviewed previously, 
are crosstalk and quorum sensing. So this is what we could say is kind of communication or sensing among microbes, allowing them to sense the presence of other populations and then either respond somehow or attack or peacefully coexist. Crossfeeding is another important concept and very easy to understand this. Not all microbes have all of the enzymatic machinery that they need, for example, in order to digest carbohydrates or metabolize phytochemicals. So each microbe that's addressing a certain type of fiber or a certain phytochemical might only be able to do part of the job. So maybe some microbes can start the process of digestion. They create certain metabolites, such as acetate, for example. And then other microbes take that acetate and turn it into butyric acid, for example. So that's part of the concept of cross-feeding. But when you understand that none of them can do the job entirely, then you also understand the interdependence of gastrointestinal microbes because they depend on each other to either do the previous part or the following part or somewhere in the chain of uh, metabolic processing for different phytochemicals and different types of fiber. So that's part of the reason why when the microbiome is disturbed through stress or antibiotics that we see these kind of profound and long-lasting changes and that's because the I want to use the term chain of command even though it's not really chain of command but the the chain of uh, community among the microbes, the chain of cross-feeding, obviously, the chain of symbiosis and mutualism has been broken. And so, you know, obviously that's difficult to recuperate. Uh, it doesn't just happen by throwing in a handful of probiotics. Mutualism is a term I just mentioned. The symbiotic combinations of crosstalk, quorum sensing, cross-feeding, so all these microbes have to kind of team together. We could say teamwork, perhaps, rather than mutualism. Another rather awkward term in this genre of conversation is microbial endocrinology. And that's a really awkward term, and I've never liked it, but uh, that is the term that's kind of officially used to describe the fact that microbes can actually sense when their host is stressed. For example, some microbes have receptors for norepinephrine, and when their host is stressed, they actually become more pathogenic. So, you know, in a perfect world, which is not the world that we live in, I suppose we would want these microbes to be nicer to us. When we're stressed out, our microbes give us a break. But in fact, the opposite is true. When we're stressed out, those microbes that have norepinephrine receptors sense that we're stressed and they try to take advantage of it. For example, they might produce more toxins, they might proliferate more, they might become more adherent to the mucosa, which gives them a better chance of causing infection and infiltrating the tissue and perhaps translocating, etc. So what microbial endocrinology means, even though, again, it's a rather cumbersome and kind of misleading term, it's not really microbial endocrinology, but that is the term that's used. What that means, again, is that the microbes have receptors for stress hormones, such as norepinephrine, and when the host is stressed, microbes become more aggressive. I have certainly never heard of any example of a microbe becoming nicer or more benign when the host is stressed out. Typically, they become more virulent, more adhesion factors, more proliferation, uh, and the secretion, in some cases, of more microbial toxins. Gut microbes have three distinct locations, and this explains why, at least in part, you will never get the whole picture by doing stool tests. So I've talked about that before. In fact, I decided to dedicate an entire video, video number four, to what I called exploring kind of the concept. I think I referred to it as conceptual plasma. This concept of stool testing and what are you going to do with that information or, or any type of microbiologic testing, what are you going to do with that information? You're never going to get the complete picture. Now, for most of us who have done stool testing, I assume, we've all seen surprising results. Sometimes we get results back and they're completely normal, even though we know uh, intuitively or through other ways, even though we know that our patients have dysbiosis, sometimes their stool tests are completely normal. And the opposite is true. Every once in a while we do a stool test on somebody who may just have interest in performing the test because they've read about 
dysbiosis and microbiome, or maybe they have a little bit of a clinical indication, and sometimes we find rather horrific results. Also, if you recall the video that I recorded previously, video number 11, when I was talking about the gastrointestinal microbiome and gastrointestinal dysbiosis, I actually had a patient just this past year who submitted a stool test to two different labs within the same month and got radically different results. One lab simply reported a few dysbiotic bacteria, and the other lab, at the same time frame, showed that he had at least two different parasites. Uh, parasites meaning rather major microorganisms like amoebas, cysts, etc. So that's the plus and minus of doing stool tests. Sometimes we get good information, uh, sometimes we don't get good information, sometimes the lab tests miss what we're looking for, and that's because they don't have adequate technology, they don't have, or maybe it's just, you know, logistically impossible for them to provide culture results, for example, on bacteria that are notoriously difficult or impossible to culture. But what I want to show you in this diagram is kind of a, a deeper understanding of all of those ideas. So let's take a look at this. Some bacteria, some microbes, live in the lumen of the gastrointestinal tract. You could think of those as being free floaters. They digest contents. They make metabolites. They're living kind of in the tube, we might say towards the center of the tube. Other bacteria, other microbes, live in the mucus layer, so they're not in the center of the tube, and they're not on the mucosa. They're swimming around in the mucus. One of these bacteria that's kind of famous for swimming around and consuming mucus is Acromantia municifila. We'll talk about that particular bacteria more. But as you would guess from its name, municifila, it loves mucus. It loves mucin. So some bacteria, again, live in the lumen. Some are in the mucus and some are directly on the mucosa, talking to the enteric nervous system, talking to the immune system, talking to those individual dendritic cells that are projecting a little appendage out into the lumen and sensing the climate within that lumen. Food, phytochemicals, fibers, fatty acids, nutrients, and of course microbes. So let's take a look at this diagram, which is excerpted from Nature Reviews Gastroenterology and Hepatology 2015, Optimal Sampling of the Intestinal Microbiota for Research. On the left-hand side of that image, you can see that these authors discuss some bacteria that are particular to the lumen, others at the mucus layer, and then on the right-hand side, they talk about dysbiosis, and you'll see that things change quite a bit. You'll also notice absolutely no mention of segmented filamentous bacteria, and we know that those bacteria, according to animal studies, are very important for the induction of interleukin-17 and the Th17 uh, aggressive inflammatory immunocytes. Also, those same segmented filamentous bacteria are known to occur in humans and especially in ulcerative colitis. So, this was an interesting article, 2015. I was a bit surprised that they made no mention of segmented filamentous bacteria. I also wanted to mention a bit more about this fiber drink that I was advocating in video number 11. So I mentioned to you that a lot of patients benefit tremendously, not simply from increasing their intake of fiber, but specifically from a kind of a fiber blend or a phytochemical blend. And I showed you this recipe. Hello everyone, Dr. Alex Vasquez here with our program on human microbiome and dysbiosis in clinical disease. This is the video series that accompanies the printed monograph. In that monograph, you also have most of the printed presentation slides, and you also have password protected access to more than 12 hours of additional video to help you understand and clinically apply this information. What I'm going to do right now is focus on what I consider to be the core highlights of the information. I'll walk you through some case reports so that we can apply that information clinically because, of course, the emphasis of the program is the translation of basic sciences into clinical practice. You'll find this to be particularly relevant for patients with diabetes, obesity, insulin resistance, and cardiometabolic disease, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, which has recently been renamed systemic exertion intolerance disease,
Also, I will discuss some neuropsychiatric conditions such as autism and chronic pain and depression. And of course, major emphasis will be placed on the autoimmune and rheumatic diseases such as psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, Sjogren's syndrome, and multiple sclerosis. This slide provides a listing of the core content, and you might also use this as a mental checklist. We start with a pretest, and that allows us to assess baseline knowledge. It also allows us to assess the overall effectiveness of this learning program. Then we have the printed monograph, and then, of course, now we are entering into the video series and the video presentations. After we've gone through the pretest, the printed monograph, and the video presentations, then we access the final exam and that gives you a chance to complete the program and print off your certificate of achievement. So again, taking our focus back to the video presentations, we're starting right now with number one, which is pathophysiologic mechanisms. I'll also talk about microbes, molecules, and morphology. So what the science shows us is that hydrogen sulfide is a mitochondrial poison very similar to cyanide, except that hydrogen sulfide is produced from microbes within the gastrointestinal tract. So we want to consider addressing this component anytime we're dealing with a patient who has what I call dysbiotic mitochondriopathy. So this is a mitochondrial disorder caused by dysbiosis because now we have evidence very clearly that these gastrointestinal bacteria can produce mitochondrial toxins. D-lactic acid is a mitochondrial toxin produced by gastrointestinal bacteria. Hydrogen sulfide is also a mitochondrial toxin produced by gastrointestinal bacteria. And I showed you earlier that endotoxin from gram-negative bacteria also produces mitochondrial dysfunction. So I think many of you will find interest in the fact that you can bind or neutralize hydrogen sulfide by using a specific vitamin, and I'll show you that in just a moment. Let's substantiate this concept just a little bit more before we move on to clinical applications. Microbial pathways in colonic sulfur metabolism and links with health and disease. You can see this was published in Frontiers in Physiology in November of 2012. Now we have arrived at the end of this presentation, so let's all take a deep breath, congratulate ourselves. We just talked about the microbial mechanisms, molecules, and morphology. We're now going to move on to the next video in the series, and we're going to focus on pathophysiologic responses triggered by these microbial exposures, and that will help us transition from microbes through pathophysiology and ultimately to clinical prototypes and more ways that we can manage the microbiome and dysbiotic responses in clinical practice. So I look forward to presenting that information on pathophysiologic responses that serve as the interface between the microbe and the clinical outcomes that we see in our practices.